So section 2.7, we're gonna start with example A and a refresher in function notation. So first things first, I wanna refresh yourself this way. F plus G of negative one is kind of a fancy way of writing F of negative one plus G of negative one. Yeah, it does save a little space, it's modest, but mostly what I want you to get comfortable with is the notation. In contrast, this would be F of negative one minus G of negative one and so on. But we'll actually go back and evaluate these in just a minute. The next one, of course, would be multiplication. And the last one's gonna be division, f of negative one divided by g of negative one. And let's figure out what each of these things are. So to do that, we're gonna to need to determine what f of negative one is and what g of negative one is. For that, let's look at the graphs. We've got a couple of graphs provided for us. And in particular, that looks like our y-axis right there. So that means this point here is negative one. And I wanna know, first of all, what's f of negative one? Yeah, it's one. So if you look at the y height right here, at the function for f, f of negative one is one. Nice. Let's continue. How about g of negative one? What's g of negative one? g of negative one is gonna be four. Good, that's up here. So g of negative one is four. So with those values, we can then fill in all the rest of this stuff. So let's work on that. Um, this is gonna be one plus four, which is five, one minus four, which is negative three, one times four, which is four, and finally one divided by four, which doesn't really simplify anything to anything further. Yay, nice. Now we can kind of extend this notation a little bit, and we don't have to necessarily work with functions. We can just keep on working with, um, you know, the algebraic part of the function, not plugging in numbers. And we could work with something like f plus g of x. Well, that's going to be f of x plus g of x. And for us, that then means f of x is three minus x squared. g of x is x squared minus four. When I combine those together, what do I get? Notice you can add up like terms. What's gonna be left? Negative, Negative one, that's it. The x squareds cancel each other out, right? So good there. Let's look at another one, f minus g of x. And here we gotta be a little bit more careful. You get that minus involved. And what that minus is gonna mean for us is that you've gotta distribute that negative to the second term. So it's gonna be three minus x squared minus x squared minus four. Now that double negative, or excuse me, that negative distributes itself to both terms here. So we end up with three minus x squared, minus x squared again, plus four. And that'll simplify. What does that simplify down to? Huh? Nice, nice. I didn't catch whose voice that was. Well done. All right, so negative two x squared plus seven. Beautiful. Again, you gotta be careful with that negative here that it distributes itself to both terms. That's why I put parentheses around the x squared minus four so that I can better visualize that that's gotta distribute itself. All right. Uh, Let's keep going. 
f times g of x. Well, that's going to be f of x, which is 3 minus x squared, times g of x, which is x squared minus 4. And for this one, uh, it's just back to something familiar from a long time ago, which is FOIL. First, outside, inside, last. First term is going to give me 3x squared minus 12 minus x to the fourth and then plus 4x squared. Now, if I combine those into like terms, I'm going to start by writing out the minus x to the fourth first. What like terms can I combine here? X squared and one x squared. Yeah, here's your like terms. 3x squared plus 4x squared gives me 7x squared. 7x squared. Well done. 7x squared minus 12. Now, typically, you write your polynomials in decreasing order of the terms. So, something to the fourth power, something to the second power. We don't have any odd powers. So, finally, after that, the constant. The reason for that, as you'll see in the next chapter, you can tell a lot just by looking at this term of your polynomial. You know that it opens down. You know that eventually it's going to point towards negative infinity in both directions, off to the left and off to the right of the graph. So there's a lot of information you get just by looking at that little part. All right, let's finish it up by looking at um, f divided by g. Now, all of these are asking you for their domains. And for the first three of them, their domains are all real numbers. Polynomials are defined for every real number. So domains are going to be negative infinity to infinity. That's for the first three. I still need to figure out the domain for the last one. Now for the last one, let me give myself a little bit of room here. Um, this way. Last one is f of x divided by g of x, which is going to be 3 minus x squared divided by x squared minus 4. Your domain is no longer just everything. What could go wrong with this function? Yep, could end up with 0 in the denominator. We don't want that. So where could x squared minus 4 equal 0? That's when x squared equals 4 or x equals plus or minus 2. Don't forget the double or that there's two solutions there, one positive, one negative. Here's where it gets a little bit messy because these are the ones we don't want. So if you don't want those, if you want to avoid negative 2 and 2, then your interval is going to look like this. Negative infinity to negative 2, negative 2 to 2, and 2 to infinity. That's your domain for this one. So when it's all said and done, your domain is kind of in three pieces there. All right. So mostly this is notation. And like I said, one thing that you can keep in mind is polynomials always have a domain of negative infinity to infinity. Now I did have another way to write this the other day. Does anyone remember what it was? Script R. Script R. All right. All real numbers. That's essentially what it is. Looking good there. Comments or thoughts on example B here? Let's keep going. Um,
I'm going to kind of cover these next couple out of order because I think it's a little easier visually to see and understand this one with example F. And then we'll go back and work examples D and E uh, or C and D. Then work on example uh, uh, E. It says draw the graphs of F, G, and F plus G. Well, hmm. So here's our graph of f of x. And let's understand a little something about the domain. So the domain for this, well, the one problem that we're going to run into is a negative underneath the square root. So for f of x, the domain, I want it to be 1 plus x has to be greater than or equal to 0. That's going to be the domain there. If I move the 1 to the side, I get x is greater than or equal to negative 1. And you can see that pretty easily. That's going to be your domain. And you can see the graph here. It starts at negative 1 and goes off towards infinity. What about the domain for 1 minus x? Well, let's find the domain here. I'm running into the same problem. I want one minus X to be greater than or equal to zero because I don't want to take the square root of something negative. Now I'm going to do this one a little different than I did the last one. Uh, I don't know. Um, no, I won't. I'll just do it kind of the same way. I'm going to get X by itself on the left-hand side. So I'll move the, the one to the other side. It becomes negative. I'm not done though. What else do I have to do in order to solve here? Divide by negative, Divide by negative one. Divide and flip the sign. Switch the sign. Ah, well done. You have to flip the sign. So we get X is less than or equal to one. All right, well, that points the opposite direction. So that's gonna start out at one and point in the opposite direction. So that's this way. Okay. Now, when it comes time to adding the two functions together, f plus g of x is going to be the square root of 1 plus x plus the square root of 1 minus x. That function, that new function, is only going to be defined where both of the functions are defined. I can't have this function defined out here at four because g of x isn't defined at four. I can't have this function defined at negative three because it's not defined out here. So they're only defined where these regions overlap. Where do they, where do they overlap? Between negative one and one. So that's your domain. That's where these things overlap. So the domain let's call this maybe h of x. That's the sum of these two functions. Uh, the domain for h of x. is negative one to one. Brackets are parentheses though. What do you think there? Um, brackets. Brackets, yeah. Because they're both defined at negative one, they're both defined at positive one. So you can include the endpoints. So again, it's where they overlap. That's where these functions are gonna be defined. All right, let me go back and take a look at uh, some other domain problems with that one as kind of our warm up. Let's look at example C. And I'm going to write this on a separate sheet of paper because so I'm going to need it. 
Um, so for example, C, we're gonna define, we're gonna look at this one, F plus G of X. And that's gonna be the square root of 16 minus X squared plus the square root of X plus three. I wanna know what's the domain of this function. Okay. It's gonna be where the domains overlap. So where, where do the domains overlap? I gotta find the domain for each function. So let's work on the domain for g of x, that's going to be easier. And then I'll work on the domain for f of x. What do I have to have happen for the values of x that I put into that function? Here's your g of x up here. Oh, this is your f of x. This is your g of x. f of x. What has to be true about the values of x that I put in here? What, what am I worried about happening? Perfect. Thank you. x plus 3 has to be greater than or equal to 0. And that means x is greater than or equal to negative 3. Beautiful. Someone else for f of x. We haven't hit the hard part of f of x yet. What has to be true about f of x, the, the values of x that I put in there? I might just do all the work. What's, what has to be true here? That also has to be greater than or equal to zero. Perfect. This has to be greater than or equal to zero. Now, you cannot just move the x squared to the other side and take the square roots and call it a day. It won't work. This is a polynomial. We spent a whole section on solving these types of polynomials. You got zero on one side. I'm going to factor this one. And it factors as 4 minus x times 4 plus x. And I want to know where that's greater than or equal to zero. Can anyone remind me how I finished solving this? So both of them equal to zero. Yeah, let's, let's figure out when they're actually equal to zero. And they actually equal zero at what point? When x equals? Negative four and four. Negative four and four. Thank you. Um, Jason, what intervals do this, does this give me? Oh, uh, negative infinity to four. Mm -hmm. Good. For the maximum. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Noah, I need some test points for these, please. Negative five. Good. Zero. Uh-huh. Five. Perfect. So those are some test points, negative five, zero, and five. Do you need practice on plugging this into your calculator and or decimals, or can I just give you the happy ending? <laughs> happy ending? Yeah. All right. So it's going to test out negative, positive, negative. Which interval or intervals do I want? Yeah, I want the, yeah, I want the positive interval, right? All right, so... That's going to be this one. Can I use the endpoints? No. Let's see. If you plug in negative four or positive four, 16 minus four squared is zero. Is zero greater than or equal to zero? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So I can use four and I can use negative four. So would that mean brackets or parentheses? Brackets. Right. brackets. There you go. All right, so the domain here is negative four to four. 
the domain here was negative three to infinity. Let's see where those overlap. Because where they overlap, that's where you're gonna have your solution. So let's see, I'll graph this one in orange and this one in a very manly pink and we'll see how those look. So, so one, two, three, four, five, six. Negative four, negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three, and four. All right, so my first function, the domain is here, negative four to four. And maybe I'll put solid dots on either end. Okay. How about the other one? Well, that was solid dot on negative three and going out forever. Now, I probably should give myself a little bit more room to the right. Where do these overlap? Three and four. Yep. So they overlap right here. That's where they overlap. So negative three to four. So the domain for f plus g of x is negative three to four. Brackets or parentheses on those? Brackets, yeah, you can include them because this is defined at both, you know, both functions. So they overlap here and they overlap here, negative three to four. Beautiful. Now, if you actually looked at the graph for the functions, you can. It's, it's particularly easy to do in Desmos. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let me, let's see. Uh, yeah. Let's just do it this way f of x is going to be the square root of 16 minus x squared. What does that look like, by the way? Top half of a circle, circle, right? Yep, that's exactly what it is. Semi-circle, yeah. And then g of x is the square root of x plus 3. Uh, uh, screwed up my parentheses there. Uh, you're messing with me, g of x. There you go. Notice g of x starts at negative three. Now, when they where they overlap, that's going to be our function for g of x. And watch what happens when we graph the sum of those. And this is kind of cool. You can do it on your graphic calculator in a, in a different way. H of X is F of X plus G of X. And wow, that's the sum of the two functions. Notice that that sum, let me shut off these other ones. Notice that that sum is only defined between negative three and positive four, right? That's, that's all you get because you can't define the graph where one part or the other is not present. I can't define it to the right of four because there's nothing there for f of x. I can't define it to the left of negative three because there's nothing there for g of x. So it's only where they overlap that you get that function. Now there's something else I wanna point out about this graph. When you do problem number, uh, I think it's E or D, one of those other ones where it's coming up, we're gonna start adding these graphs together. Before I get there, Sydney. Uh, let me get back to that in a minute. Um, so when you're when you're adding these graphs together, you're just really adding points together. And let me demonstrate that. So for instance, at zero, you've got the square root of three, which is about 1.732. What about for my function for f. Well, if I put in a zero there, I get the square root of 16 and that's four. So if I add 1.732 and four, I should get 5.732. Okay, perfect. 
That's exactly what I see on this graph. Uh, how about over here? Well, the graph for F is at zero in the Y coordinate and zero plus the square root of 32. Uh, no, uh, wait, a uh, wait a minute. Oh, excuse me, the square root of seven, my bad. Zero plus the square root of seven. All right, that's about 2.46 or 646. That's fine. So all you're doing is you're adding up the Y values here for your purple graph and your black graph to get the value for the blue graph or the red graph. So it's a straightforward addition. Now, if you wanted to do something like this with your graphing calculator, uh, it takes a little finesse, but not a lot. You can do it. Um, and I'll just kind of briefly show you how to do it. Um, yeah, let's see, clear this out, uh, quit, um, clear, and clear. So I'm going to plug in the two functions. So let me clear out this one. Let's also shut off the plot. That should not be on in this class at all. Square root of 16 minus x squared. That's my first one. My second one is going to be square root of x plus 3. x plus 3. Now, the brute force approach to this would be just to type in square root of 16 minus x squared plus square root of x plus 3. But you're not paying me the big bucks to show you the, e you know, the, the really easy way. You guys want some finesse. So let me give you some finesse here. Um, right here, with your cursor on the third line, click VARS. So if you click VARS, and then click Y VARS, and it takes you over to function. Now press enter. And it says, oh, do you want Y1? And say, yeah, I want Y1. So press enter. And that gives you Y1. Now, y3, I'm going to define as the sum of these first two functions, right? So I'm going to put a plus here. And what else do you want, think I want to put here? y2. So let me repeat that. So you're going to go back and go to vars, y vars, function, and this time type the number 2, and bam. Now you've created a third function, which is the sum of the other two functions. That's the cool way to do it. Now you can set up your window any way you want. Uh, I'm going to set it up from negative four to four on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, I know I don't need to go below zero. So let me just reset that as like, you know, negative one. Uh, and on the y direction, I'll set it up to five. Now each of these graphs have, has a different color. So you can kind of see what's going on there. All right, I didn't hit it high enough, but it's giving you kind of the same thing we got with Desmos. Um, let me just up that to maybe an eight. That should cover everything. There you go. So, all right, well done. Is that, is that a cool trick? Did you guys like that one? All right, nice. Thanks for asking, Sydney. All right. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, let's keep going. Let's keep going. So we got to go back and um, take a look at example C in a couple more cases. Uh, or actually, we'll just do one more case. That's the, the important one. Um, so say this example C continued. CTD continued. This time we're going to look at f of x divided by g of x, which is going to be the square root of 16 minus x squared divided by the square root of x plus 3. Okay, oh, did we see I'm what sorry. you were doing? Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't switch my screen. There you go. My bad. Thank you. <clears throat> now, this is not a whole lot different than our previous problem. 
but it is going to make one little important difference. And let's see if we can't spot it from the graph first, and then we'll see if we can't translate it to the algebra part second. But let's take a look at the graph here. If I did a new function, let's call it j of x. And you know you can do similar stuff on your graphing calculator. You can do y1 divided by y2, but I'm going to call this j of x um, equals, uh, let's see, um, f of x divided by g of x. Hmm. Well, I still want to determine the domain. At least the right part of the domain goes up to four. But what about the left part of the domain? Yeah, it's uh, passing oh. through at negative three. Yeah, it's it's having problems at negative three, right? I mean, even if I scroll up, you know, something strange has happened here at negative three. So let's look back at our our graph, or not our graph, but our function. Can I put in negative three into this function? Jason, why not? Well, let's just do it. There'd be zero in the denominator, right? Yeah, so that's a mathematical no-no. Don't pass go, don't collect $200, right? You just can't divide by zero. So, all right, bummer. So, um, whereas before we had to have the domain of the numerator was negative four to four, and the domain of the denominator was negative three to infinity, you can't let x equal negative three anymore because you're going to be dividing by zero at that point. So, uh, but x cannot equal negative three because it would create a division by zero. So overall, the domain of this new function, this one here, domain is negative three to four. Negative three gets a parenthesis. And that's definitely a, a point on that one to get parentheses and brackets straight. Jen, something about this trouble you? Oh, no. Okay, all right, that's good. All right, we're we looking good on the second part of example C that we actually did here. Okay. Um, let's try example D. And I'm not going to turn to the um, handout. I'm just going to write example D here. This time we've got f of x is square root of x plus 5 minus square root of, is that 8 minus x? Yes, 8 minus x over x. Now there's three parts to this function. Let's see if we can't figure out the domain for each of these. Um, so for this first part, what has to be true? X has to be greater than or equal to negative five or your domain is here, negative five to infinity. Okay, how about the second one, second part of this? What has to be true about this? Well, square root of eight minus X, that means eight minus X has to be greater than or equal to zero, or eight is less than or equal to X, or X is less than or equal to eight. So, okay. I've got another part of this. I've got everything less than or equal to negative eight. There's one more little piece I've got to worry about. 
Yeah, what's true about the X? Can't equal zero. Thank you, Julian. X can't equal zero. So I've got these two parts. Um, this one here, which goes on forever. This one here, which goes on forever. And they're overlapping in between, but the one point they can't overlap at is zero. Can't equal zero. So as far as your interval is concerned, where they overlap, it's gonna be negative five to zero and zero to eight. Now, if you're watching this later at home or if you're watching it now, try and put in the correct parentheses and brackets to finish this one up. All right, what's it gonna be here? Bracket or parenthesis? Bracket. Bracket, parenthesis, parenthesis, bracket. You guys rock, awesome, awesome. Well done on that, thank you. So yeah, we can't use a zero. So it gets the parentheses, everything else gets a bracket. Nice. Uh, let's go back and, and take a quick look at um, adding functions. So this is example E. Uh, I'd rather show it up here. So here's your two graphs. Here's G, here's F. F is just a line with a negative slope. G is, you know, either part of an ellipse. Yeah, part of an ellipse it looks like. But let's see if we can't figure out what F plus G looks like. Now, I'm gonna label these one through four, so that we can talk about them. Um, let's see. Yeah. No, no, no. So starting the upper left, that'd be one. Upper right would be two. Bottom left, three. Bottom right would be four. Let's see if we can't figure out which graph is which. Now, realistically, there's two of these graphs that I can eliminate pretty quickly. And let me just number my graphs here. One, two, three, and four. Now, when I'm working with these graphs and adding them, remember you're adding things point-wise. So choose a couple of points that are easy for you to work with. Now, for me, it's the right-hand endpoint. For instance, the right-hand endpoint of this right here is at negative two. The right-hand endpoint of this one is positive two. But when you add something negative and something positive, it's not gonna get bigger. The graph of F plus G can't be bigger than G because F is gonna be, for the most part, pulling the graph of G down. So I can eliminate this one and this one, because the graph of F plus G is bigger than the graph of G. Graph of F, especially starting to the right of two, should be pulling down on the graph. All right, both of these look like they're doing the right thing. They're pulling the graph of F down, but one of them's a little bit better than the other one. So if you look at what happens at negative, or at, uh, F of six, F of six is negative two, G of six is positive two. When you add those together, you should get a zero, but there's not a zero on this graph. There is a zero on this graph. And then when you start looking a little further over here to the left, one plus two, oh yeah, that's three. Here at zero, zero plus 
four is four. So everything starts to line up pretty good when you start looking at that one. Nice, nice. Okay, um, so the correct graph is number four. Okay. Now there's a couple more examples we gotta do. And I think we got enough, yeah, I might go over by a couple minutes here. And I apologize. Um, so some function composition stuff. So this first one is something called iteration. When you start doing a function again, you take the input from one function, get an output, and then that's the output into the function again. So for instance, f of f of two, you're gonna start with the innermost parentheses. So it's gonna be f of two. f of two is gonna be four times two minus three. Uh, yeah, so eight minus three is five. Okay, great. So f of f of two is really same thing as f of five. So then you go back to the function with f of five. Which is gonna be four times five minus three, which is 17. And that's it. That's all there is to part A on this one. That was easy. Yeah, <laughs> I kind of think so. All right. Uh, how about this, this next one down here? Kind of the same thing. Let me just scratch off a little room up here. Do that up here. This time we're starting out with what? What should I put into my function first? Yeah, so it's gonna be G of three. So G of three is gonna be five minus three squared. So let's do that. Five minus three squared, which is five minus nine, which is negative four. So I'll put that into my function. So that's really g of negative four. And let's see if we can't figure out what g of negative four is. G of negative four is gonna be five minus four squared, which is five minus 16. I said four squared, five minus negative four squared, which is 16, five minus 16 is negative 11. Beautiful. Done. Should be an easy one on the homework. Example H is kind of similar, except they're mixing up f and g a little bit. They first start you out with the innermost part of this. What should I be looking at to get the innermost part? g of negative four. Good, so g of negative four, um, let's find that over here. One, two, three, four. g of negative four gives you what? All right, so f of g of negative four is f of three. And then f of three is zero. And that's it. Example i below it is very similar to this one. It's just you're using a table instead of the graph. Uh, I do kind of like the graph better. If I was going to choose one to put on there, I'd probably choose this. Uh, the AP exams for calculus, um, when, you, when you take those, they probably use this. All right. We'll start out with the inside. It's going to be G of F of 2. Well, F of 2, what's F of 2 going to be? 3. 3. three. 
nice. So f of two is three. And so then I want to find g of three. G of three is four. Again, done. That was easy. Yes. <laughs> All right. Last two. J and K. The idea behind J and K is you want to pick up functions that you can put together in the right order to make this function. So this function, when you take some more math, you're going to have to start looking at it as being the composition of two functions. You're putting two functions together. There's one what I call the outer function and what's one which I call the inner function. Now it's probably a little easier to see the outer function and the inner function down here. So let's start with example K. What's the outside function look like here? Well, what are you doing to the one minus X to the fourth? You're taking its absolute value. So that's your outside function is the absolute value. So call that the absolute value of X. So that's your F of X. What's the inside function? Awesome, thank you. One minus X to the fourth. And if you put those together as H of X is F of G of X, then it's gonna be F of the inside function, which is F of one minus X to the fourth. Um, let's see, let's do it here. One minus X to the fourth. And then when you go to the function for F, F says take the absolute value of whatever you've got here. So that becomes um, the absolute value of one minus X to the fourth. So, okay, good. Now, when you enter your answer for some of these, um, it's gonna have to look like this. You would enter in F of X, so it'd be the absolute value of X comma, and then G of X, one minus x to the fourth. So just a heads up as to how you're gonna to have to input your answers. Like I said, this one's a little easier to see than the other one. The other one, again, you've got an outside and an inside function. And the order does make a difference. Because if I put this in the wrong order, if I did um, f of x was one minus x to the fourth and g of x was the absolute value, don't copy this down. But then if I follow through on this, that'd be f of uh, f of the absolute value of x. And then you go to the function for x, it's one minus absolute value of x to the fourth. That's a completely different function than what we got. All right, so there's two functions here. One of them is a reciprocal function. One of them is X plus one. Try and think about it for a second and figure out, well, what's gonna be the outside function? What's gonna be the inside function? What do I put into what? So what's my outside function? What's the F of X? Is it one over X or X plus one? Well, in this case, the outside function is your f of x is one over x, and g of x is x plus one is the inside function. And if you put those two together as f of g of x, you're gonna get one over one plus, or one over x plus one. Yay, sweet. All right, sorry to rush things at the end there, but I hope we're doing good. Comments or thoughts on that last one? Yeah, yeah you, you know, part of it's experience and practice, I won't lie. Um, but the other part is you, you got to kind of take a step back and say, well, what's the outside function? Uh, or what, what do I see first? And what I see first is the reciprocal of something. Now, with something this simple, you know, you don't have to pain yourself too much because there's only two choices, right? There's this way or there's this way. Um, f of x is x plus one and g of x 
is one over X. So what you can do is just try it one way. And if it works, great. If it doesn't work, try it the other way. Let's take a look at what would happen if I tried it this way. If I did F of G of X, well, let's back this one out, F of G of X, G of X is one over X. And if I put that into the function for F of X, that'd be one over X plus one. And that's not what I wanted, which is one over X plus one. So then you could try it the other way. Um, I know that's probably not as satisfying as you might like, but a lot of these are gonna be a little bit easier to see that, okay, something's on the outside and then something else on the inside. And whatever's on the outside, that's gonna be your F of X. That's gonna be the function that has to go first. And the stuff that's on the inside, your G of X um, has to be that inner part right there. So uh, it's it takes some practice. Uh, let me give you one last kind of uh, quick example, I guess, that you're asking and you look patient there. <laughs> um, if I had uh, H of X was um, X squared minus nine to the third power, F of X and G of X. What's my outside function? What would you guess? Well, it's something to the third power, right? So X cubed. What's that leave for the inside function? X squared. X squared minus nine. There you go. So again, it's your outside and your inside function. So. All right, hope that helps. Uh, comments or questions, anything else? All right, let me stop the recording and then uh, ask one more thing of you.